Hello and welcome to another episode of The World at Temple where we bring the world to you. I'm your host, Lavinia Roland, and today we'll be giving you a look at what we've been up to recently. From how to make Venezuelan arepas to the family dynamic of many African households. All of this today on The World at Temple. that Philadelphia is the first city in the United States to be named a World Heritage City? This March of 2019, the annual celebration of Globalization Concert hosted by the Office of International Affairs highlighted John Smith III. He is the Board Chair Emeritus and Senior Counselor of the Global Philadelphia Association, who also played a crucial role in the city's globalization. Let's take a look at what Mr. Smith has to say about this honor. Hey, my name is, is John Smith. Uh, I am currently the Chairman Emeritus of the Board of Directors of the Global Philadelphia Association. I had the opportunity to found the organization together with others back in 2010. And ever since that time, up till just the end of this last year, I've chaired the board and I've been essentially the chief executive officer as well. The idea behind GPA is really uh, several fold. First of all, we want to enhance everybody's awareness here in this region of the importance of thinking internationally, thinking globally. And secondly, we want to establish Philadelphia as a true global city. Oh, I'm so, I'm so proud of the Expo. Uh, this is something that my colleague, uh, Zibet Tilak Singh, has really uh, done an extraordinary job with. Uh, together with several others, uh, we founded something called the Philadelphia Chamber Ensemble with members of the, uh, of the Philadelphia Orchestra. The world is much closer than it ever has been. We're more interconnected, and we know we're more interconnected. And it has had a, a, an impact as people have become perhaps more nationalist in their thinking, uh, perhaps trying to hold this notion of globalization uh, at arm's length so that it won't wash over me and change my life. It's clear that that is a pipe dream. Globalization is with us and will be with us, and it will continue to change our lives. So, I think what we can best do is to understand it and think about how we can most constructively engage with the fact that we're now part of a much larger world. I'm very optimistic because I see tremendous potential in all of the young people I've had the opportunity to work with. You guys are the future, okay? Uh, there will be a time when uh, uh, John Smith will just have to step aside and turn the world's keys over to you and your generation. We can either be uh, scared of globalization or we can take it uh, and do something positive with it. And I hope it'll be the latter. I've had the privilege and opportunity to travel almost all my life. Uh, and when you get to know people from other parts of the world, you realize that, yeah, they've got different belief systems and they've got different uh, uh, languages and uh, uh, different perspectives. But deep down inside, they are you and you are they. We're, we're, we're human beings trying to figure it out. I guess the short statement would be, there's more to be gained by engaging with the world than running away from it. Congratulations to John Smith for his work. It's also important that Temple University's very own president, Richard Englert, was also awarded this honor at the celebration. 
We have so many outstanding students here at Temple and today with us from the Film and Media Arts program at Temple are Chi Yu San and Valerie Bailey. They've been working with each other on the set of Big Trouble in Little America, an MFA thesis comedy series directed and written by Chi Yu San. Thank you so much ladies for joining us on the show today. Of course. Yeah, I'm just going to ask you to introduce yourself a little bit. So tell me about like your nationality, your major and what year you're in. So, um, my name is Tiyue Sang. Uh, I go by Q. I come from okay. China. And uh, I'm a graduate in Temple right now in Film and Media Arts Department. I'm on my third year, hopefully graduating in May. Nice. <coughs> what about you, Valerie? Um, I'm Valerie. Um, I'm a uh, senior here at Temple in the film program, and I also study business and Italian. And wow. um, yeah, hopefully, can't wait to graduate soon. <laughs> <laughs> you never know. <laughs> Stop That's awesome. Um, so tell me a little bit about this project you've been working on, Big Trouble in Little <coughs> America. What is it about? Uh, so it's my graduate thesis. Okay. It's about four different Chinese girls and their experience in Philadelphia in a quirky, dark comedy way. Wow. Talk about like how weird Spain is because we, we all know how weird it is <laughs> and you know being a foreigner here how does that feel cool yeah. why did you pick comedy because I know like mm -hmm. in order to be able to write comedy especially mm -hmm. in a in a cultural setting outside of your own you're, you mm -hmm. need to have a deep understanding of the culture yeah. so how did you go about um, navigating that um, I always really like comedy especially TV comedies and stuff uh, so I want I come in, in knowing I want to make comedy for my thesis okay. and I that's my uh, form and then I decided to find the most comfortable content I have which is my kind of like my own experience but also share the experience of all like Chinese international students right. in a way. Yeah. Okay did you grow up watching um, does this project reflect American comedy or more Asian comedy what do you think? Uh, I think it's kind of mixed in, in a way I feel like my the core of my comedy is a little bit on the darker side which mm -hmm. is more closer to like Asian comedy you talk okay. about like really like no funny <laughs> subjects yeah but kind of try to still make it funny because everything's funny gotcha. um, but I do think in a way I'm definitely kind of affected by American comedies um, like there's some jokes in there just like just silly mm -hmm. and yeah and the my biggest inspiration is one of the shows is Insecure, which is an HBO comedy show. Okay. And like web series like uh, Broad City and like High Maintenance, they're gotcha. just also like, yeah, shows right. that it's inspiring. Yeah. That's, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. Valerie, yeah. tell me your experience like working with Q and how that's been, how you've had to, like, what has your research process been in <coughs> order to get this story of four Asian girls across? Well, I've been fortunate enough to actually work on another Chinese project um, that I'm also producing. So I'm more familiar with the culture okay. and how to approach it, um, mm -hmm. just because Chinese cinema is pretty different from American cinema. Um, but I mean, working with Q, I mean, she's pretty different compared to like anybody else I've worked with. It was my, definitely my first <laughs> comedy series. Yeah. Um, but it was just a very positive and fun um, work environment mm -hmm. and um, you know we didn't take ourselves too seriously right. um, there were definitely stressful moments um, but that's just a part of working in film okay um, but yeah I mean if we goofed up or like something happened we were yeah. just like all right well it is what it is let's <laughs> yeah. fix it and yeah. move on and, and it was cool to you know approach comedy from like a different culture um, mm -hmm. just because American comedy is um, a little more detached I think with mm -hmm. uh, Chinese cinema you have like right. a much stronger focus on um, the character and their relationships which mm -hmm. I think um, this series does really well. That's awesome. Is, have you like um, previewed it yet? Have you shown it? Have you presented it yet? I mean. uh, we just finished uh, the cuts of the first two episodes okay. and uh, not finished. It hasn't taken too long yet but uh, still in the process I've been showing people the first episode and I've got some really nice feedback so nice. that's really nice. Yeah. Okay, I just wanted to make sure you weren't spoiling anything on oh. the show. <sighs> it's not really like, <laughs> no, we won't. No. 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 Okay. <laughs> we can't. Okay. We can't. <laughs> um, so since you both are film majors, how do you think media and film specifically can affect the way someone learns about a culture or, or to reflect a person's culture? How do you think that's significant from other platforms? I mean, it's incredibly important. Mm -hmm. um, you have the ability to completely manipulate a message and put forth whatever you want. 
Yeah. Um, and as filmmakers, I think we have an obligation to, and you know, we should have like a moral code and be able to um, send the correct message and the right one, um, you know, that spreads warmth, kindness, and diversity. Um, of course, you get people that don't do that, but um, you know, that's just part of the process and having that's to deal so with true. it and just making sure that um, you know you stick to your own values yeah. and what's right. Yeah, yeah. so true. Uh, no, you can go ahead. Uh, I think all message can mean something in a way. That's like basically my reason of making movie in a way. Mm -hmm. Like I feel like no matter what I say in my film, it's going to be a different message from anyone else and it's going to represent my culture. So I think what's the most important thing for filmmakers is to be honest about who they are and mm -hmm. present what they have. And that I think that's lacking in cinema in a way right now. Yeah. That's so true. I think like the the topic of representation on film and whose stories are we telling has been a rising mm -hmm. issue and I think it's so important the work you're doing because you're conveying things from your perspective mm -hmm. and and like you said it's open to interpretation like mm -hmm. anyone can in interpret it differently yeah. so I think that's awesome um, mm -hmm. what do you think your individual takeaway has been from working with someone from a different culture how have you like grown or what's mm -hmm. what's the thing you what's been a highlight yeah. for you uh. <laughs> The time. Uh, highlights? <coughs> um, I think it's definitely like what I said, like being who I am, mm -hmm. make people like Valerie was talking about, I'm different from other people she met, and people been telling me that and make me feel like who I am, make people know China more than mm -hmm. they already are. Mm -hmm. They're like, oh, they're different people from there. So that's one of my favorite. Like, I, I've always loved to show my crew and like show people around me, like, Food from China, and like yeah. I remember <laughs> that one night we were yeah. working on my uh, proposal for my thesis, and I just brought some uh, river crabs from wow. China. Probably not <laughs> legal. Which I probably shouldn't say it, but anyways, it's not important. <laughs> it's it's all like <laughs> eaten by me, so it's no, yeah. no trace, no trace. Um, but yes, yeah, so I show because most people eat like Asian, like no Asian, like ocean crabs, like okay. sea crabs here, but they don't really eat river crabs. Right. I show her the crabs. So you got to experience <coughs> a cultural dish. I I did, and you know, um, and that's just one of the privileges I think of working on, um, you know, a film that's just culturally different. Mm -hmm. um, it's been so beneficial to me as a um, filmmaker and as especially as a film producer because mm -hmm. I'm going to approach um, very unique problems and I have to be able to know how to fix them um, or deal with them. And, you know, I get a lot of questions like that, especially they're like, well, what about language barriers or things like this? And I'm, you know, it's never really phased me as a film producer. I think it's always been part of the fun um, mm -hmm. because I've learned so many different things and yeah. it's allowed me to have a very open mind. So yeah. it's always great. Well, thank yeah. you. Thank you so much for coming on the show and sharing your perspective with us. I'm so excited to see your work and I, I think this is so important what you're doing. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank, thank you. you. Now let's move on to the kind of segment on a show that everybody loves, food. For this episode, our team learned how to make delicious Venezuelan arepas with Anna Linares. Join us for Cooking with Cameron. Hi, welcome to Cooking with Cameron. I'm Cameron, I'm here today with Anna from Venezuela. <laughs> Should we say your name? Hi, welcome to Cooking with Cameron. I'm here, I'm gonna restart. Uh. Hi, <laughs> <laughs> welcome to Cooking with Cameron. I'm Cameron, and today I'm here with Anna from Venezuela. And we're making arepas. Uh, all right, so let's go over some of the components of the uh, of the dish. So, what do we need to make this? So, for the arepas, we need this corn flour. That this is the one that we usually use. We mix it with water and salt. Um, for the chicken, we boil uh, chicken breast with onions and then half of a chicken cube. That's how we call it.
Just try and make it as smooth as possible. My mom does it every day. <laughs> Sometimes I get tired, I just don't have to stop. Every day? Almost like every night. That's a, that's a lot. Because all you need is water, so that's it's true. not like you need something else. And you can put cheese in that stuff. It does seem pretty versatile. It is. And I don't know if you have seen the news, but my country right now doesn't have like a lot of food or anything. Uh, yeah. So this is pretty easy to do if you want to feed people. I try to do like a huge bowl, put everything together, and if everything sticks, I feel like that's when I know that it's done. What I do, not everyone does this. I found out this later. I kind of just like spin it and it kind of like flattens down, but it's still fat in the middle. So you just push. And this is how it's supposed to look. It could be olive oil or just regular oil. And then with a paper towel, um, try to uh, spread it as much as possible. My mom bought me this. It's called bulare, but you can usually just use a pen. Ready. And what I do next is that I put them in the toaster for three minutes so they can get crispy outside and fluffy inside. Today we're gonna fill them in with chicken and avocado. For the avocado mix, we're gonna smash the avocados and then put chopped onions. Salt. That's a lot. Where's this cheese coming into play? So I usually put it at the end when I already open the area mm. and put the filling and then I put the cheese on top. But if you want to put it with the mix, you can also do that. So you can sprinkle the cheese if you want to. Mm -hmm. So the cheese I use is fresh cheese. This one, I got it at Costco. So this dish, uh, they also do it in Colombia, but they do it differently. They don't open up the arepas, they just put the filling on top of it. Which is, I think it's weird, but it's not for them. Good job, Cameron. We can't wait to see what dish we learn to make next on Cooking with Cameron. The Society of Emerging African Leaders at Temple University, also known as SEAL, is a student-run organization at Temple whose interest is to enrich and empower the African continent with strong leaders. Here today to share with us about African family dynamics and values are Nana Kwesi, Nyantechi, and Bebisola Ogunyemi, the two presidents of SEAL. Thank you so much for joining us on the show today, guys. Thank you, Thank you so much for having us. Okay, so I'm just going to get you to introduce yourself. What's your year? What major are you in? And where are you from? Um, okay, my name is Nana Kwisi like you said. I'm Ghanaian, and I'm an international student, a uh, third-year biology student. Nice. Okay, what about you, Bemi Sola? Well, like you said, my name is Bemi Sola, but people call me Bemi. Um, I am a third-year kinesiology student, and I am Nigerian. Cool, okay, a Nigerian and a Ghanaian. Now tell me about your roles in SEAL. Okay, um, so together we're the co-presidents of SEAL. We pretty much um, oversee the runnings of um, our executive board as well as our general body. Um, we curate and put together like our events, our general body meetings, which are bi-weekly. Um, every sale that we have from bake sales to food sales, any type of promotion, sometimes um, mixers or mm -hmm. just like 
engagement activities on campus to our main events like our business conference in the fall wow. and our gala at the end of the spring semester to wrap up the entire academic year. Okay, so it's a very engaging organization, very active with events and stuff? Yes. Nice. Bem Solo, can you tell me about what SEAL's mission is or what you guys have managed to achieve over the years? Um, I would say the main mission of SEAL is to um, equip people, whoever and from wherever origin, care to um, not only just understand the socio-economical issues that are currently facing the continent, but also people who want to make change to that. And in our various um, industries, how that can be possible, we discuss like, you know, various ways that we as individuals can make that change. Right, that's great. It's it sounds very empowering and I'm and and you guys are very engaging and so I'm I'm really glad that that is a, that is something that African students can get involved in to feel um, active when they come here and stuff. Do you guys most do you have a lot of African American students or is it mostly international African students? Um, I would say that it's a combination like our org is open to whoever cares about the issue okay. and continents of Africa, like things cool. that face Africa. So right. we do have a good portion of um, international African students, mm -hmm. um, students like myself, mm -hmm. who are diaspora um, students who have, um, who are first, second generation American, like that as well, as well as African American and Caribbean, um, that like we, we open our, um, our, meetings to everybody, so yeah, okay. anybody can. Cool. Um, SEAL just had an event called Family Matters where you talk about the dynamics of an African household. Would you like to like elaborate on that? What is it like growing up in an African household? What are some of the values? What are some of the cultural things that drive an American family, uh, sorry, an African family's lifestyle? <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> We basically talked about a lot of stereotypes about the African family that is portrayed through the media, portrayed okay. through like uh, social media comedians that have African origin to um, African movies that have managed to make um, a break, especially in, in, in America where like, for example, if you're, if you're a child of an African parent, you have like three choices in terms of a career, either be a doctor, a lawyer, <laughs> or a right. banker, or, or even maybe a, an engineer. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, like, you don't have a career. So, like, we talked about all these expectations that our parents put, uh, put on us. We, talk, we talked about all these expectations that society also puts on us being um, African kids as well. We talked about gender roles and gender nor uh, norms, especially in, a, in an African household. And we didn't talk about it only from, like, a strictly, let's say, continental African point of view. We also talked about it on the perspective from the perspective of a first generation um, mm. American who has African origin as well how that differs from the continental African yeah. how there's similarities what was transferred over just pretty much that cool so what are some of the like stark differences between your lifestyle growing up in Africa and you being a first generation American like what are some of the distinctions that you've picked up just off the top of my head, I would say that, for example, um, just living in, a, in America, it's pretty more free. Um, it's pretty more. Uh, it's pretty more individualistic mm -hmm. than living in Africa. For example, the whole like in most African cultures, the entire community raises every everyone's kid, as opposed to living yeah. in a single home in America, where like. Whatever happens in your in your quarters, it's your own business, and like there's gotcha. no neighbor inclusion. Okay. Um, just di anybody can discipline you back home, like if they see fit. <laughs> okay. Most of the times, yeah, I'm not yeah. saying like it's exactly what happens all of the time, but most yeah. of the times, like if you're doing something that they deem as wrong, then mm -hmm. anybody can discipline you, and you wouldn't want your parents knowing that. Well, the neighbor had to come discipline right. because now you have. You have a second disciplining going to happen, yeah. but you don't find a lot of uh, a lot of that happening in America. That's one major one I can point out. Gotcha. So uh, growing up in Africa, it's more community centered. Yes. And okay. Any thoughts, Vemisola? As he said that, it kind of made me laugh because <laughs> I feel like um, African parents or African people in general, no matter where they go, they always like. I think that's why. It's not just them too, but like I think that's why community is something that they 
seek to find. And yeah. I feel that in my experience with my parents, like our family friends, our people that I, even though we might not be blood related, have yeah. come to be like my uncles and aunties, <laughs> quote unquote. So if they see me like wherever and I'm like not, you know, representing my family right. to like the standard that they have in line for me like they have no problem yeah. calling me out on it so um i just think that it's interesting how like it might not be like um my neighbor like my immediate yeah. neighbor but like within like african communities i feel like mm -hmm. we we still kind of hold that that, um, that, that value yeah okay before we end i have a controversial question whose jollof is better <laughs> <laughs> can you tell us first what jollof is um, well, I, I don't like to toot my own horn, but I've okay. been told that I make pretty good jello off because okay. I make she them does. at the, <laughs> so at our sales and right. stuff as well. So, so. jello, what is in jello rice? It's a kind of fried rice or baked rice, um, depending on where you come from. Yeah, so <laughs> it's usually, well, as a Nigerian, yeah. we like pear-boiled long grain rice. Okay. Other cultures, they like jasmine rice. So, <laughs> whatever, I, 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 I think that, um aside from those rices it's pretty much a similar um what do you call it it's a similar recipe so okay. it consists of tomato paste um fresh tomatoes um red peppers like the bell peppers as well as the um scotch bonnet peppers or okay. really it's a really spicy dish for some but like it's very yeah, enjoyable yeah. it's um enjoyed at parties yeah. at home it's very it's a very easy way to i guess get introduced to west african cuisine cool yes. yeah for context there is an ongoing debate between <laughs> whose jollof is better between ghana and nigeria and so yeah and I i'm a nigerian so and he said you heard it himself it's, it's pretty good I didn't right, right. so nigerian jollof we have we have a winner <laughs> um but yeah thank you so much for coming on the show with us today guys and sharing what it's like growing up in an african household and even growing up with that same culture in america thank you for being with us and good luck with seal thank, thank you. you so much for having us With such a strong presence of international students at Temple, we wanted to find out why they chose Temple University and what their experiences have been like on campus and in the United States. Our reporter Rob Witenski managed to get insight on what some of the students here thought. Namaste. <laughs> Hi, my name is Mit Rajani. I am from Uganda. I am a senior here and I'm majoring in international business. My name is Ramit Panama. I'm from India. My major is finance and international business and I'm a senior. Um, the things I love about Temple are the diversity here. Um, there's a huge number of um, people, uh, cultures and backgrounds here. So I chose Temple because I wanted to diversify my options. I wanted to look what the outcome would be and I also wanted to learn in a physical, uh, physical world, so that is why I chose Temple. The Temple has really shaped me and um, really prepared me to be a good professional going out of school. I'll, I'll miss most, miss uh, the tech nights where I used to sit all night long studying for my test. I'll miss hanging out with my friends, going out to parties. Um, I'll miss learning new things every day from professors. We, we have some great professors that we learn from and I'll really miss that. Um, and I'll really, really miss Temple and the food that Temple has to provide. So I feel it's not a full stop in my life. It's another chapter and the chapter is gonna continue. I feel great about graduating, but at the same time, I feel upset about leaving Temple. Uh, it's, not, it's not a very good feeling at the same time. It's an exciting new chapter in my life. So I'm really happy as well. Mujhe Temple se pyar hai. It's always important to highlight not just our international student leaders, but all of our international students here on campus who help make Temple a more culturally rich university. Well, that's it for this episode. A huge thank you to our reporters, Rob Witenski and Cameron Toft for their stories, and to our guests for coming on the show. As always, we hope that these stories have given you a new and exciting cultural perspective. Until next time, have fun exploring the world at Temple.